Amen. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 this morning. We are going to continue this morning talking about the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And we're going to talk this morning about the church in Pergamum. The church in Pergamum is very interesting. It is the most up in the north uh, excuse me, in the, in the northeast corner of Turkey. And it is the, is the church that is the furthest north up into that area. And it is also, ironically, right next to where they have discovered the city of Troy. How many, you know, the city, the legend of Troy, and they thought that it's been in different places recently, uh, I think in the last 10 years, they have discovered through uh, uh, these digs out there that this is the probability of where this city actually existed, the city of Troy. And it is right just north of where the city uh, or the church in Pergam was. And I think that that is quite ironic. Because approximately, if we had to guess, about 15 to 20 years prior to what Jesus says in our text, this was the site of the legend of the Trojan War. How many know that story? Right? So the Greeks have come in and there, there's this, this uh, problem between the Greeks and the city of Troy and the Greeks come in and they begin to uh, wage war against the Trojans. But they cannot break through. They cannot defeat them. And there is a siege surrounding the city uh, for over 10 years. Legend says that they stood out there for 10 years fighting and could not break through. They were unable to have an effective outer attack against this city, which leads to the legend of the Trojan horse, right? You know this story? That's the legend that the Greeks decide that they're going to use a little uh, trickery and they build a great big giant statue, this horse, as tribute to the city of Troy. And, uh, you know, they tell them, you know, oh, this, we give up. Here's for your victory. You know, we're going to pay honor to you. And uh, they built this horse. They say, the legend says they built this horse in about three days. And then they put about 30 of their elite soldiers in the belly of this horse. And then they burnt their camps. They burnt all their tents. And they got into their boats and they sailed away in broad daylight so that Troy saw them sailing away. But they left one guy. And then when nightfall came, they are, or Troy had brought, brought the horse inside and shut the gates. And then when nightfall came, the Greeks turned around and they came back under cover of night. And these elite soldiers got out of the belly of the horse and opened up the gates. And the rest is legend. Uh, I can't say history because we don't know exactly how true this is. But according to legend, they opened the gates and all of the Greeks came in and they conquered the city. Now, we know there's some nuggets of truth in there somewhere, but we don't know exactly what all is true. But according to legend, this is how they got in. And I think that it's ironic that this is right next to where the church in Pergamum was. See, something very similar happens to the church in Pergamum. You know, if the enemy has a problem trying to conquer and come in and, and, and mount a forward attack, he doesn't just give up and go home. Instead, he will alter his strategy and try to come on the inside and attack in a different way. And that's exactly what happens to the church in Pergamum. And so let's talk about this this morning out of Revelation chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 12 this morning. The Bible says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who keep teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans, and therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly. 
and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. Okay, so let's look, first of all, let's look at the deadly silence that takes place here. So you notice in our text that Jesus makes reference to an Old Testament story. And he's referencing a story that takes place in the book of Numbers, and it is the story of Balak and Balaam. And so Israel has come out of Egypt, right? They've been set free, and they're traveling, and they're working their way towards the promised land. But in the midst of this, they end up camped somewhere in the plains of Moab. And they camp right out there, and they're sitting there, and the king of Moab is a man named Balak. And Balak sees this huge, huge mass of people, this huge force, and he fears them. And so he knows that mounting a, an attack against these people is not his best option, that he would be defeated. And so what he does is he goes to a seer, a soothsayer named Balaam, and he asks Balaam, he says, I want you to come and I want you to curse the people of Israel, right? And so Balaam says to him, Balaam says, well, I'm going to have to talk to God. Okay. So Balaam goes to the God of Israel, and he tells them this, and God says, no, you're not going to curse my people. But Balaam is a sneaky kind of guy, and he wants the money that Balak is offering him. And so eventually he ends up going with them, and Balak takes him uh, to three different places where they overlook and look down on Israel. And Balak says, now curse them. And so Balak begins to cry out, but he cannot curse them. And instead, he blesses them. And they go to the next place, and the same thing happens. And the next place, and the same thing happens. And Balak gets very upset with him because he will not or cannot curse them. And Balaam says to him, look, man, I can't do anything because God won't allow me to do it. But Balaam, being who Balaam is, still wants the reward. So he pulls Balak aside, and he says, look, we're not going to be able to do this the way that you want to do it. We're not going to be able to curse these people, but I have a better idea. So they begin to shift their strategy, and, and Balaam tells Balak, what you need to do is you need to take all of the Moabite women, and you need to go put them before the men of Israel and entice them and entrap them. And so Balaam does this. And it works like a charm. Within no time, the men of Israel are taking the Moabite women as wives. They're taking them in. They are defiling themselves. And they are accepting all of the gods of the Moabites. And now all of a sudden, Israel is in a mess. They're worshiping pagan gods. They're doing all of these things because... All of a sudden, the enemy began to shift his strategy and began to focus not on an outside attack, but on an inside attack. See, just like the Greeks, they understood that we're not going to be able to conquer them from the outside. But we could sneak in on the inside and begin to corrupt from the inside. See, that's the reason that God references this Old Testament story as he speaks to this church, because that is exactly what has happened. They have been enticed by the outside culture. They have been enticed by outside gods. They have allowed these things to come in, and now these things are beginning to influence and pervert the church of God. So how did this happen? Well, the problem was either one of two major things here. The problem was either the church in Pergamum was oblivious to what was taking place, or they simply refused to deal with it. They saw what was happening, but they refused to deal with it. How many know either one is just as dangerous? You cannot be oblivious to what is going on around you. And when you recognize these things, you cannot ignore them. Pleading ignorance is not an excuse. We know that the enemy is trying to come in. 
We know that the enemy is trying to get you and I as a church to compromise. That is the first step. If I can just get them to compromise, then step by step, all of a sudden, little, little sin begins to take hold and it begins to grow and it begins to grow. And then before you know it, we turn around and we are not the same church that we were at the beginning. It, oh, how many know that, that when we walk away from God, it always starts with just a little bit of compromise? Well, just a little bit won't hurt. Well, I could just do a little bit or go a little bit there or whatever it is. It just always starts with this little bit of compromise and we begin to crack open that door and the enemy gets a foothold in and before you know it, both the doors are swung wide open and it's chaos. We cannot ignore it and just expect it to magically go away. Because what's actually going to happen is it's going to get worse. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, Paul says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? The Living Bible says, what a terrible thing it is that you are boasting about your purity and yet you let this sort of thing go on. Don't you realize that if even one person is allowed to go on sinning, soon everybody's going to be affected by it. See, if we respond with silence, what are we communicating? If we just ignore sin and we ignore these things that are happening and growing and we say nothing and we do nothing and we respond with silence, what is it that we're actually saying? We're saying we approve of that. That's okay. And that is the message that we send and that is how it begins to permeate and grow and grow and grow. Let's look secondly at this deadly growth. See, I would say, personally, my opinion, I would say that this right here is one of the greatest threats to the church, especially the American church. We allow things to go on and on and on, even when we know they are bad for the church. We continue to allow them to go on because we don't want to address them. We don't want to deal with confrontation. How many people love confrontation? There is this few refusal to confront internal problems. Why? Because it's so much easier to address the enemy that is at our gate than the enemy that is in our midst. It's so much easier to point the finger out there and say, yeah, the enemy, man, that the devil's out there and we're not going to let him get away with it. While we ignore the enemy that has snuck in and begins to spread sin, discord, gossip, rebellion, and all of these other things that are taking place, we just simply ignore it because, you know, that's a, that's a face that I recognize. I don't want to deal with that. I want to deal with that. I think it has a lot to do with wanting to be accepted by the world as well. You know, how many know that nobody wants to be seen as a judgmental church? I don't want to be seen as a judgmental church. You hear people tell stories of, man, I went to that church and I was wearing jeans and a t-shirt and man, they just made me feel terrible because I wasn't dressed in a tuxedo and this and that and the other. You know, nobody wants to be that church where people come and they don't feel welcome, they don't feel accepted because people are judgmental about what they do or look like on the outside, you know. Oh, they just, you know, they judge me. Nobody wants to be that church. We want to be accepting. We want to be loving, right? But today's culture has decided, and I don't know who decided it, but a bunch of people in our culture, somehow they got together behind our back and they had a secret meeting, and they decided that the number one sin, the biggest sin of all, is intolerance. That is the biggest sin in our culture now. You must be accepting of everything and everyone and everyone's lifestyle, no matter what it is. You must, because if not, you are an intolerant, horrible, racist bigot. 
That, is, that has become the greatest sin in our culture now is to be intolerant. And so if you as a church, you know, if you say, well, man, that's wrong and this is wrong. and that, Oh, you're so sinful and judgmental and just intolerant. What kind of Christian are you? This is what we're faced with. Well, no, 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 we, won't, we don't want to be seen as that type of a church. See, that's the mark of a, of a good Christian today. What's a good Christian? A good Christian is one that just, uh, it, it, it just love just pours out of their heart. Rainbows pour out of their mouth. When they sneeze, glitter comes out. No matter what is happening, no matter what people are doing, no matter what is taking place, it is just love, 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 acceptance, 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 tolerance, tolerance, tolerance. And I'm not saying that that is entirely a bad thing. Don't get me wrong in any way. But there comes a point when, when we have to stand on the truth of the Word of God. Guess what? Abortion is wrong. But our society and culture says, how dare you be so judgmental against this girl that has done that or this or that or the other. No, no, you're missing the point. What we're saying is that that's wrong. Immorality is wrong. How dare you? She loves him. Yeah, 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 but she's married to another dude. Yes, but she loves him. How dare you judge? No, that, that's, that's wrong. Idolatry is wrong. See, we're not allowed to call sin, sin anymore because then all of a sudden we become hateful, judgmental people. You just need to love and accept everything the way that God does, brother. You just need to stop being so judgmental. Here, let me share something with you. God loved me in the midst of all my horrible sin. Absolutely, that's a fact. But God did not accept me that way. See, do, you, do you see the difference? Do you see where that line is? Does God love that sinner, that person? Absolutely. But God does not accept us that way. Something has to change. We have to repent. We have to change our behavior. We have to turn away from sin and accept Christ as our Savior. We cannot just continue in sin over and over and say, oh yeah, God loves me and we're good. No, when I was living in sin, I was not good. I was in rebellion to God, and I was living in sin, and I was on my way to hell. I had to repent. I had to get my heart right. Luke 13, 3. Jesus says, I'll tell you, no. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. See, there has to be a change. We want to be a loving church. We want to be accepting. Absolutely, that is a good thing. But we have to be careful that we don't go to an unhealthy extreme to accomplish this. We have to be willing to call sin, sin. Well, we're just going to love them into the kingdom, pastor. Okay, that's great. No problem. That's what we should be doing. Love people and love them into the kingdom. No problem with that whatsoever. But after a year, after two years, after three years, and that person is still dealing with that same sin, they are not addressing it, all of a sudden, we're not loving them into the kingdom. We're loving them into hell. Because we are giving them the impression that what they're doing is okay and acceptable. They are living in sin. They're not right with God. Their heart is black and they are headed to hell. 
Don't tell me that you love someone if you're not willing to speak truth to them out of love. We're not walking around judging people and trying to point out their sin and tell them everything that's wrong in their life. No, no, no. If you do that, you and I are going to have a talk, right? We love people, and we do want to love them into the kingdom. But we have to be careful that we do not go to this extreme that what a lot of the church world out there you see is doing, where there is no sin. God just loves you as you are, no matter what you do, that's the message. Well, that's true, but the road that leads to heaven is one that requires repentance and acceptance of Christ. It requires turning away from sinful behavior. I think it also sends a message to the entire church that that is not sin. The other problem is that it allows false doctrine to come in. Well, we, well God, we're just, we're just going to let God weed that out. We're just going to let God work that out. Okay, no problem. I get that. We don't go around rebuking people and correcting everything everybody says that might be a little off. Okay? But we have to be careful that we are not letting things in that are false doctrine, that are not truth, and just accepting it and allowing it to permeate our church because we simply don't want to be judgy. We don't want to be rude. We don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Well, I know what they're saying really isn't in the Bible, but they really believe it in their heart. And then that begins to spread, and that begins to spread. That begins to grow, and all of a sudden we are embracing false doctrine. We have to be on guard and protect the truth. It will grow, and it will spread. Truth must be our number one priority. That must come first. No, 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 I disagree, Pastor. Love should be our first priority. Love should be our first priority. Not the truth. Does that make sense to you? We put truth on the back burner in order to show love. Don't tell me that's love when that person's going to hell. If you love someone, you are willing to speak truth to them, even if it might hurt. Even if it might damage the relationship. If you truly love that person, you must be willing to speak truth to them. Loving somebody into hell is not love. That's being a coward. Because you're scared of confrontation. You're scared of hurting someone's feelings. You're scared of being looked at as the bad guy. You're scared of being looked at as someone who's judgmental. You're scared of being looked at as someone who's intolerant. But we cannot allow somebody to go to hell because we are scared to speak truth to them. Let's look lastly at having a proper balance here. So in verse 14... Jesus says, but I have a few things against you. Now, if you remember uh, back, one of the first sermons that we preached in this series was talking about the corporate you. The word you that is used there when he says, I have this against you, is the Greek word su. And it means, it is the second person singular word. So remember, when he addresses the church, when he says you, he's not talking to a group of people. He is talking to one person. We as a church are a body. We are held responsible for each other's lives, the direction of this church. He speaks to the church as a single entity, as a body of believers, as you. He is not talking to the one or two or five people that have brought this problem into the church of Pergamum. 
Because believe me, the entire church did not cause this problem to happen. It has been brought in by a handful of people, and it has begun to spread. But when Jesus addresses it, he doesn't address those three or four people that have brought in the problem. What he's addressing is the entire church. Why? Because they have allowed it to happen. He is holding the entire church accountable because they have seen it, they've watched it, and they have stood back and done nothing. They have allowed it to happen. Week after week, month after month, year after year, they have watched it, they have seen it, they've allowed it in, and they have refused to address it. Sin false doctrine, idolatry, bad attitudes, gossip, rebellion, whatever it is, when we allow these things in, if you leave these things alone, left unchecked, these things can and will eventually destroy a church. Let me say that again. Sin, rebellion, attitudes, idolatry, gossip, All of these things, if we just simply allow them in and say, no, 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 it's fine, we don't want to be judgmental, all of a sudden these things will grow and permeate the life and the culture of a church, and it can and will destroy a church. What do you think the purpose of that sin is when it gets in? The purpose of the enemy bringing these things in is not because he's trying to hurt one or two people. He is trying to shut down what that church is doing. If he can simply get that church to compromise and move away from the will of God, then all of a sudden it just becomes a social club that is doing nothing for the kingdom of God and the devil is completely satisfied. It always begins with compromise. Verse 16, Jesus says, Therefore repent, or else I'm coming to you quickly. In other words, he says, Okay, church, I'm going to give you an opportunity to deal with this. You have to stop ignoring it. You need to address it. I'm going to give you this opportunity. But then Jesus says, But if you don't deal with it, I'm going to deal with it. And and I imagine that he sounds like the Hulk when he says that, right? He's like, I'm coming to you quickly. And you won't like it when I come to you quickly. Right? It's kind of like this little hidden warning that he has in there. Deal with it. How many of you ever address your kids this way? And you say, okay, this is going to be dealt with. You got a week. And if it's not done then I'm going to deal with it. And you're not going to like the way I deal with it. And then they come home, and everything they own is out in the yard. I cleaned your room. It's clean. Remember the church in Ephesus? Let's go back for just a second. Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Here Jesus addresses the church in Ephesus, and he says, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false, and you have preserved and have endured for my name's, for, excuse me, for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You know, this church is very interesting because it is almost the exact opposite of the church in Pergamum. The church in Ephesus was all about doctrine. They were all about truth. They were all about the word. They were, man, you didn't bring anything false in there because, buddy, they would nail you immediately. You didn't compromise truth. You didn't compromise the word. But the problem was they had no love. They had no grace. They had no mercy for people. In Pergamum, you see sort of the exact opposite thing. They just love and accept and tolerate everything that comes in the door, but because of that, they are compromising truth. 
They're like the complete antithesis of each other. You know, you and I as a church must have the proper balance of these things. We must be a church that loves people first and foremost, that cares about people, that has grace and mercy, that is able to look at their own life and say, yeah, I've been there. I've been in that situation. I I know what this is like. I know what that's like. I used to be a horrible sinner. I used to struggle with this or struggle with that. To be able to empathize with people, to be be able to love people and help them through uh, everything that they're going through and disciple and lead them to Christ, while at the same time not compromising truth. Not compromising the gospel. We don't go get drunk with someone in order to reach out to them. Well, you know, I just want to relate. When in Rome, you know, that's how I'm going to reach them. No. We do not compromise the foundational beliefs and doctrine that Christ has given us. Truth must stand. We have to have a right balance. We must be willing to defend truth. We must be willing to stand on truth. How many know not everybody's going to like that? How many know that oftentimes we are going to be called judgmental? We are going to be, they're just unloving. That church is just judgmental. They're just mean. They just have no love and they just have no mercy. You could show grace and mercy for 10 years. And certain people, the second you say, you know, brother, I just really care about you and I love you and everything like that. But, you know, for the last 10 years, I've just, I've noticed this. And and I just think, man, God wants to set you free from that. You judgmental. You, you don't know me. God, you don't know me. God knows me. How did I got to go find a church that has love in it? There is no love in that church. That happens. That happens. Not everybody's going to like it, and it doesn't matter how you approach it. When you speak truth, there are simply people that are not going to like it because they do not want to hear truth. They do not want to change who they are. They do not want to give up their sin. They simply want you to accept them with their sin. They simply want you to tell them, yep, Jesus loves you and you're going to heaven too, even in the midst of that sin. And if you tell them anything different, you are a horrible human being. In fact, Jesus says, you know what? If everybody likes you, you're probably not doing it right. Jesus said that. Look at Luke 6, 26. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. He says in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. You know, they did not put Jesus Christ on the cross and crucify him because he gave people fish and loaves and healed people. Remember that he preached a sermon where he had a crowd that was everywhere, and by the time he got done preaching that sermon, everybody got up and left. Why? Because he he spoke harsh truths, and he looked at his disciples and said, will you go too? Everybody got up and left. How dare this guy stand up and say these mean, horrible things? What happened to the fish and the loaves and the miracles? How dare he speak? What a jerk. Let's go, Betty. This is how a person who's upset walks. I don't know. (laughs) How dare Jesus say those things? And he looks at his disciples and he says, will you go too? 
Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace. Remember that. He said, I came to bring a sword. There is division. The problem with some of the mega churches out there, the problem with so much of, of, of church culture today is, is this just uh, uh, this willingness to compromise without a second thought. The willingness to just, whatever makes people happy, whatever puts butts in seats and money in the offering plate, that's what I'll preach. That's what I'll say. That's what builds my ministry. That's what builds the church. The willingness to do that is just upsetting. Where is your conscience as a church, as a minister of the gospel, to speak truth? I want to close this morning. We have to remember that the enemy is not always going to attack from the outside. We have to remember that the attack of the enemy is not always as obvious as we think that it might be. The enemy is not just standing outside with torches and pitchforks and Arr! Sometimes he sneaks in and he begins to spread discord, he begins to spread sin, he begins to spread gossip. Do you know how you deal with gossip? It's very simple. You simply say, no, 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 I don't want to hear that. It's none of my business. You simply say, well, you know what? Let's go talk to that person right now. Because the person that really wants to address it, they'll say, you know what? We need to do that. The person that just wants to gossip will say, oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. We, we, you don't need to talk to them. It drives me nuts when people say, well, people, well, I don't want to say who said this, that, and the other, but no, no, that's gossip. You know how you deal with gossip? No, let's address it right now. Let's bring those people. Let's talk. Let's be open about it and deal with the issue. That's how you deal with it. It's not as hard as people think. But see, the devil loves to spread that. He loves to spread compromise. You know what? That's, that's not going to hurt. Just a, just a little. And we compromise. The devil loves to come in. You know, I think that internal strife and struggles are probably more difficult to deal with than the outside ones. Because the enemy's so clear when they're outside the gates. They're so easy to spot and easy to see. Like I said, you'll notice them. They have a pitchfork and a torch. They're green and have big ears and have a donkey with them. Internal struggles bring nothing but division. They stop the forward momentum of God. And it's easy to simply want to ignore them and hope they go away because we don't want to deal with that. Nobody wants to deal with it. Nobody enjoys confrontation. But the problem is we cannot ignore it because it must be addressed as the danger that it really is. False doctrine is absolutely overwhelming the New Testament church today. Make no mistake. Turn on TBN. It is permeating our church. False doctrine and nonsense. You and I have the Word of God. We have the Bible. It has been given to us. There is not a person in this room who doesn't have a Bible or the ability to have a Bible. And do you know what that means, unfortunately? It means that we have no excuse for accepting false doctrine in our lives, in our homes, in our marriage, in our church, in any of it. We have no excuse. We have the Word of God. The problem with so many of us when it comes to this, and not to be offensive, is we are raising a Christian illiterate culture. We go to church, we do those things, but we don't actually know what the Bible says or what the Word of God says. There are people in this room, and I love you to death, but there are some of you in this room that have said things to me, excuse me, and you've said things to me, and, and, and I thought, well, well, there you go. I, how else do you respond? 
It's like, wait, that's not biblical at all. Where do they get that? And so you try very, you know, politely. Well, you know, brother, I don't, I don't know if that's really, if that's really there. Well, I just believe such and such and such and such, you know. Be careful with that phrase. Be very careful with the phrase, well, I know that's not really in the Bible, but I just believe that's dangerous. If it's not in the Bible, if it's not in the Word of God, I don't want any part of it. We have to know what it says. You cannot defend truth if you don't know it, right? We have to crack that thing open. We have to read it. I want to close this morning very quickly. Jesus says in John 8, 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I want to close quickly this morning because I know we have a lot of things to do, but just very quickly, I do want to ask if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you do not know him as your personal Lord and Savior, you're living in sin, you're not right with him. This morning, if that's you, I want to ask you to just simply lift your hand and get your heart right with God. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed, no one's looking around. It's between you and God and you and God only. I see that hand, you can put it down. God's tugging on your heart, if you feel the conviction of God, just be willing to respond to that and say, I want to get my heart right with Jesus this morning. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to close, but if you lifted your hand this morning, I want you to say this prayer with me. I want you to say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to come into my heart.